All right, good morning. I feel a slight cool breeze on me, and it's wonderful. Oh, this is good. I actually had, um, I had uh, dinner last night with a guy I haven't seen for 17 years. I was in dive school with. He was up uh, in the Buffalo area. And uh, we were down at the waterfront. He's, man, it's so cold. He's from Florida. And it gets to 110 degrees during the day, and he works construction. So it was just wonderful. I'm outside. I'm enjoying life, you know, and his wife has a sweatshirt on. The son has a coat on. I'm like, whew, yeah, that's a different world there. So thankful for the weather today and thankful for air conditioning, as always. But, you know, before we get going, let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as we remembered him this morning, um, his death on the cross, and just partaking in that feast of just remembering the bread and the blo- uh, bread and the wine and remembering that body and the blood that was spilled for us. So thank you for that. Lord, I pray for your, uh, your word to go forward today, um, your thoughts, your spirit to work, not anything um, man-made or contrived out of human ambition or goals, but just strictly the Holy Spirit working in the lives of believers that want to honor their Lord with everything they say and do. And it's his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So when uh, my dad asked me a while ago to speak on anger, you always got to kind of wonder, what's he thinking about? (laughs) And uh, and truth being said, I think we can all relate to that, right? Who doesn't get angry? I, uh, at work, I... My whole life, I've been in the construction industry, military. Um, I just, I've been in the rough and tumble world my whole life, literally. And anger is something that uh, uh, can happen quickly and violently uh, with foul language and actions that uh, aren't pleasing to the Lord. And so I, I'm not going to lie and say I haven't uh, partake in that. It's something I struggle with my whole life. Uh, family. I always tell Heather, it's uh, very interesting to see. When you have kids in the early 20s, you have a lot more patience for the children than you do when you're old like me, 40. Poor Nate, okay? That guy, he's getting a rough deal. <laughs> Everybody says it's good to be the youngest and spoiled. I don't know. the way I, Those girls had it made. They won't tell you that, but I'm pretty rough on my boys. So patience is really part of dealing with anger correctly, especially in the, the scene of the home. You know, the teaching on all these emotions and, and conditions in life, especially the life of believers over the past weeks, have been very helpful to me. I think of last week, Steve Seide and his, his speaking on worry, vice concern. And I think of Mike's thoughts on um, uh, depression, the real thing of depression, and the ability to of all believers, to lead joy-filled, Christ-centered lives. But depression is real. And being depressed and disappointed is very real. I wasn't here for Lee uh, LeBeau's message on wisdom or Doug Torox on temptation, but I can, I can know that uh, those men are men of God and the Lord used them. And I pray you've been blessed by their ministry. So today i just like to take time and study anger in the life of a believer. And I took the liberty to subtitle it, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. What does scripture say about anger? And if I hear anybody say, wah, 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 yeah, no. It's not a Clint Eastwood film. It's not that exciting. So first, we're going to turn to the Bible because anything I say without biblical backing means absolutely nothing. So let's turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, we're going to go in verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. 
Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Whenever we study God's word, we need to, f- and, and how we can take what God's word says, we need to fully understand, I say it all the time, the context. When we look at Jesus and how he dealt with anger, we will further in this message, we need to understand that Jesus was 100% God and 100% man all at the same time. Our brains can't understand that. We think of 50-50, 70-30. We can't understand that 200% equals one. So we must understand that. But according to the scripture we just read, if my Bible is correct and I read it correctly, Jesus was tempted to sinfully worry. Not trusting his father. Or how about, maybe he was tempted to be depressed about the situation he was in. I'm thinking of the Garden of Gethsemane. When all his disciples slept on him, they left him. And then let's not forget Peter. Peter saying, I'll die for you. Denying him. Three times. Not once, three. Do you think Jesus was tempted to be depressed? Or disappointed? And I mean this next one as reverently as possible. Please don't hear me wrong. But I, I got the, for this point to be understood, I'm going to say it this way. Was Jesus tempted to act inappropriately to women? Let me read it again. But was in all points tempted as we are, but without sin. See, there's the linchpin there. That is key. Brothers and sisters, either the Bible is true or it's not. When it says he was tempted in every way, it means exactly that. That also means when Jesus got angry, he was tempted to sin. But as scripture said, he did not sin. Otherwise, his death on the cross would mean absolutely nothing. Let's go to 2 Timothy. Chapter 3. I should know it by heart, but I'm pretty horrible at memorization, so I always churn there. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Paul is talking to Timothy in the book of Timothy. And he's saying right here how to use scripture, not only how to live, but how to act, how to serve others. So when we look and, uh, and how we deal with anger as believers, we need to look at the entirety of scripture. And we can use scripture in its entirety. I'm not going to go too much on a rabbit trail here, but in our circles and assemblies, we have the dispensation of the ages. I'm not going to get into that. There is one God, one word of God. And how that's divided, I think we need to be very careful. The new covenant and the old covenant is divided by Christ himself at the Lord's Supper, right? That's concrete. A lot of times people look at the Old Testament, oh, that doesn't matter because it's in the Old Testament. No. Please don't think that. Otherwise, 2 Timothy 3.16 has very little meaning to us because the only scripture that Timothy had was the Old Testament. So my friends, this is where the rubber meets the road on anger. Let's go to Genesis 4. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from God, the Lord. Excuse me. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. 
Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of the time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you so angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Anger. Anger. Unrighteous human anger is ugly. It's pure evil, as Cain exhibited. See, this kind of anger is not justified. It's of the flesh. It's Andy wanting to be right. It's Andy wanting to have power over that other person. And it's from the pit of hell. An article I read by Psychology Today in preparation for this thought said this, considering the relationship between murder and anger, there are many more killings committed spontaneously and in anger than those committed with premeditation. Did you know that in 2021, New York State recorded 875 murders? In the world, there's over 400,000 homicides a year. How many of these murders are committed in anger? You see, evil in its ugliest forms can be tied to anger. It can lead to untold sin. And it is the birthplace of all sorts of human atrocities. Just look in the news. The war in Russia and Ukraine. Mutilating prisoners of war on either side. You want to talk about anger? Benjamin Franklin said, whatever is begun in anger ends in shame. There is absolutely, positively no place for ugly anger in the life of a believer. No place. The bad. That was the ugly. Now we're into the bad anger. See, I would classify the bad but not ugly anger as a sort of justified anger with uncontrolled actions and ungodly actions, right? So let's go to Exodus. Exodus chapter 2. Verses 11 and 12. Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. Now to give a little background in case you don't know, the Israelites were slaves to the Egyptians at this point and Moses was living in the household of Pharaoh. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. This is Moses, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that way. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. You see, Moses saw an injustice. A slave was getting beaten. I think that would be perfectly reasonable to intervene at that point for any one of us. 
So he acted, and I think that's good, personally. But then he goes rogue, right? He looks this way, he looks that way. I'm telling you what, if you ever got to look around to see if anybody's looking, it's probably not the right thing you're going about to do, okay? So he's looking left and looking right, all clear, and he kills a guy. In our day and age, we don't know how he died, but most of the stuff in the ancient world was very close up. There wasn't uh, seeing a bunch of guys running 200 meters out and throwing some rounds at them. It was face-to-face -face contact. He killed them, murdered them. You see, as Christ Christians, Christ followers, we got to be willing to act when we see injustice around us, right? That, I, I go back to that because I think that's something we can't lose contact with. Every, I have this vision in my head. I read a story once, and again, I don't have any founding for it, but just bear with me. Imagine the early 30s or late 30s in Germany. I believe there's Christians in Germany. We like to put people in piles, right? Oh, the Nazis were in Germany, so there must have been no Christians there. I don't quite think that's the truth. That'd be like some people from Texas or in the Bible Belt saying, I can't believe those New Yorkers. I bet you there's no Christians up there, right? I don't think it happens like that. So let's keep going here. So the Germans, there's railroad cars of railroad cars going by on a, a church on a railroad tracks. And those Christians are in there singing their hymns. And those railroad cars are full of Jews heading to concentration camps, going by, going by. Later, when the Allies freed the concentration camps, all the Germans around us, we didn't know what was happening. Eisenhower made Germans all around the towns of those concentration camps come out there and bury the dead. Wanton disregard for the injustices around us is not an excuse. And it's for us to act in righteousness. But in saying that, if, again, I'll go back to if you've got to look left, look right to make sure no one's looking, you better question your motives and what you're about to do. You see, because we are Christians, we must always remember that Christ is our king. He's it. It isn't Biden. It isn't Trump. It's Jesus Christ. His word the Bible right here has to be the roadmap or it doesn't make sense for anything. It's not our ideas, it's not my idea on what justice is or my self-conceived notion of what's right and what's wrong. It's what this Bible, what this book says is right and is wrong. It's not our own brand of justice. Let's go to Romans 12. I'm bouncing around a little bit, so bear with me. Verses 9 through 21. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heat coals of his fire on his head. Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
I read that. And as a side note, if you really want to mess with people, it's probably not the right spirit. But if someone's being mean to you or uh, being inconsiderate, be nice to them. See what happens. It's hilarious. They don't know what to do. Do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. If you're any way, shape, or form mixed up in humanity, it's easy to be overcome with anger. It's easy to be overcome with evil. See, as believers, we can't be ignorant of the hurt and pain around us. As the text said, we have to be sensitive to it. But the way we react and the way we act about that injustice has to be taken in context of Scripture. Because remember, this is our road map. I like how Paul said, if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. If it's possible, live in peace. And we got to remember that mankind is ruled and judged by God. He's in charge, not us. So I got to, in this part of anger, the ugly and the bad, I really think the bad is where I would struggle as a Christian, right? It's easy to see an injustice and then act wrongly, not like Christ-like. And we'll get into that because Christ did get angry, and we're going to talk about that, study it. So we really got to be careful not only to be sensitive to the injustice, but how we act about the injustice. You see, two wrongs do not make a, a right. The ends does not justify the means. The world would tell you differently. We're not the world. Amen. So I really appreciate these following verses on controlling our anger. So we did not bring dishonor to Christ through our actions, right? Looking left, looking right. Nobody's around. I got this guy. It's all in us. Don't pretend like you couldn't do it. We all have the capacity for murder. Proverbs 19.11 says this, The destruction destruction of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a transgression. Ecclesiastes 7.9, Do not hasten your spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. James 1, 19 to 20. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man and woman be swift to hear. (sighs) Slow to speak, slow to wrath. If we just listen to that. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And lastly, pretty sure uh, Steve read this last week, but turns to Psalms 37. Verses 8 and 9. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Believer, we have to approach injustice with the influence of Christ in us. We can't act as mere humans in anger, getting our pound of flesh when we see something wrong. But rather, we've got to behave as followers and servants of the Most High. When we really understand that we are the blood-bought sons and daughters of Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, it really should transform how we look at things and how we deal with things. Charles Spurgeon said this, Do not say, I cannot help having a bad temper. Friend, you must help it. Pray to God to help you overcome it at once. For either you must kill it or it will kill you. You cannot carry a bad temper into heaven. We cannot use anger to let our emotions cause us to sin. 
We've went over the good. Uh, we went over the bad, the ugly. And now the good anger. If there if there is such a thing. Turn to Nehemiah, please. Nehemiah chapter 5. I'm going to read the first six verses. I'm going to keep going for time's sake, sorry. And there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. For there were those who said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. There are also some who said, We have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. There are also those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as a flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And indeed, we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. And I became very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. First of all, if you ever want a great study on biblical leadership, I recommend Nehemiah. I personally like him because he's a builder slash warrior. He fits my little block in life, and I kind of like that thing. So anyway, but Nehemiah is a great leader, humble and he does a lot of right stuff. But it says in here, Nehemiah got very angry. Is he right being angry? Is he right being angry? Yeah. It was wrong. Say it. It was wrong. It was wrong. It's okay. Why was it wrong? Because it was greed. It was injustice. Read the... We're going to read 7 to 13. After serious thought, ah, he's very angry. So what does he do? I've learned in life, when you get a text message that really upsets you, don't text back immediately. Hardest lesson I had to learn. Forward, we move. After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them, each of you is exacting usury or interest, money, greed, from his brother. So I called a great assembly against them, and I said to them, According to your, our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations. Now indeed, will you even sell your brethren, or should they be sold to us? Then they were silenced and found nothing to say. Then I said, what you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? I also, with my brethren and my servants, am lending them money and grain. Please, let us stop this interest or usury. Restore now to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves and their houses, also a hundredth of the money and the grain, the new wine and the oil that... You have charged them. So they said, We will restore it and will require nothing from them. We will do as you say. Then I called the priests and required an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. Then I shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out each man from his house and from his property who does not perform this promise. Even thus may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen. And praise God. And the people did according to this promise. You notice he attacked the problem, not the people. And he didn't pit the poor against the rich either. Sound familiar? Well, they have more money than me. Well, I don't hear many people saying about the, I don't know, 98% of the population of the earth that we have tons more money though in this nation. The poorest person in the United States of America is abundantly richer than almost everybody else in the world. But he didn't put the poor against the rich. He laid out the facts. It was a thoughtful response. And I guess I want to say this, not an emotional flying off the handle. 
In modern terms, he put the phone down before he texted back, right? I once heard a quote, how you re react emotionally is a choice in any situation. How you react emotionally in a is a choice in any situation. You know, emotion makes us human, and it's a good thing. But one can be ruled by emotion. You have to watch that. Billy Graham, I'm using a lot of quotes today, but this is a good one. Billy Graham had this awesome quote. He said, hot heads and cool hearts never solved anything. Hot heads and cold hearts never solved. So you can't be hot-headed all the time trying to change the world, and you can't be cold-hearted either to what people are suffering through. So anger can be righteous. I mean, look at our world today and the many sins that we see Child abuse, sexual abuse, greed, they're very real and tragic events, been part of our existence since Adam and the fall of Adam. And I, I say this to myself very much so. I would suggest that we stop practicing raptures in the backyard and maybe invite the neighbors into the backyard. You see, it's so easy for us to move amongst our Christianized circles, right? We move from church to one another's home, which is good and it's right, it's okay, and then the camp and all that. We just bounce in these little circles and we don't go outside to that guy on the corner who's shooting up heroin. Yes, the world is doomed for destruction. It is. It literally is going to hell. And yes, we are called to be separate from the world, but we're supposed to be separate in the sense of that world deluding us and our testimony for Christ, not in the sense of we just need to be in a commune away from everybody. Consider how the early church grew. Did the apostles stay in Jerusalem? No, let's, why, would, why would you ever go somewhere else? It's really the religious epic center of the world. Why would they ever go anywhere else? Because they were forced to because that's where the people were. They were converting people, and the early converts of the church went into the world. They showed people that didn't know the truth the truth. Matthew 5, 14. I had significantly less pages of notes, and I'm still going to run it just a tad over. I apologize. Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Is it good works in the church only? No. Nah, I don't buy that for a second. We are Christ's ambassadors on earth. And we're not supposed to get angry over the sin and injustice in the world? Come on. So now we look to the best example in Scripture, Jesus Christ. There's misconceptions in the world about Jesus Christ. He's holding on to a lamb. He never says anything harsh. He talks in a mellow tone voice. Being a doormat. But if you read his word, and we will, Mark, I'll try to get through this quickly. Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, and he entered the synagogue again, and there was a man who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath. Listen to that. It's the religious people looking to see if Jesus would heal a guy who is really in pain so that they could accuse him. And he said to the man who had a withered hand, step forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful on a Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. And when he had looked around them, at them with anger, being grieved about the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other, then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Jesus was angry. John 2, verses 13 to 17. 
Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. Everybody needs visuals. Does that look like somebody that is a That's what Jesus Christ said. And the table was probably made out of stone or wood and much heavier. And he drove him out of his father's house. Is that passive? Is that standing by when injustice is happening? Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. He was 100% love. And he's 100% just. He's 100% will forgive you of every sin you have ever done but he 100% hates sin. See, as believers, we think as anger is selfish, destructive emotion that we should be eradicated from our lives altogether. However, Jesus himself got angry, and as with everything else, he was perfect in that anger. His anger had proper motivation. It was completely selfless. His anger had proper focus. It targeted at simple behavior, and true injustice. His anger had proper root causes or supplement, as they say. It had nothing to do with hatred or ill will. His anger had proper duration, right? It was long enough, just the right, the right amount of time. So it didn't turn to bitterness, excuse me, bitterness. He didn't hold a grudge, and he had a right to, right? We just read about when Jesus was at, at healing the withered hand. And he looked at anger at the Pharisees and the Herodians. What did Jesus say on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. His anger had a proper result. It was always to accomplish God's will. When you have time, we don't have time. I'm over. I tried. Ephesians 4, 17-32, read that. See, God's word speaks for itself, and we need to listen. See, in closing, we need to remember that we are the sheep of the good shepherd. We are. He is a good shepherd, but we're also followers of the Lion of Judah. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I have to read this. Because every time you want to know where life leads for us as the believers is in chapter 19 of Revelation, verse 11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he... He who sat on it was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes wars. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one, except, he, no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, that's us, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him. On, a white, on white horses, now out of his mouth goes sharp sword, a sharp sword, and with it he would strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the furiousness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. We must not act out of anger and selfish and worldly reasons, God forbid. But our lives, I'm going to go nautical on you. Life is a vast ocean right now, and you're on it. And you have one captain if you know Jesus Christ. And that anger is a very dangerous reef that only he can guide you through. And we've got to let him be Lord of our life, let him be captain of our souls. It requires complete submission to him. And his will in our life. So slow to anger. Angry at the problem, not the people. Righteous in that anger. Always acting in a way that brings honor and glory to God, not us. I close with this. John Stout said this. There is such a thing as perfect hatred, just as there is such a thing as righteous anger but it is a hatred for God's enemies, not our own enemies. It is entirely free of all spite 
rancor, and vindictiveness. And it is fired only by love for God's honor and glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for Jesus Christ. We look at his example and we require his help. And we're so happy we have the helper that is in all of us. So help us, Lord, to live as you would have us to live with all these things in the Christian life, emotion, worry, depression, seeking wisdom, temptation, and anger, Lord. Help us to be a, a light on the hill for your honor and glory. Help us to change and help people around us for your honor and glory. And Lord, when it requires us to be angry over sin, help us to hate sin, but love the sinner. And in your name we pray, amen.